the question the community has is, does this work? If you believe that it does, I'd like to hear you say I, I that. I know it does. Okay. This is Elizabeth Holmes. Six years ago, she was one of the most celebrated CEOs in Silicon Valley. Her biotech startup Theranos, which promised to revolutionize blood testing, was once valued at more than $9 billion. And Forbes hailed her as the youngest self-made female billionaire. But then Theranos' well-crafted story began to fall apart. Just days before Holmes took to the stage, at this 2015 conference, the Wall Street Journal published two articles that cast serious doubts on the effectiveness of Theranos' technology. Do you feel now, in hindsight, that maybe you went to market a little too quickly? We're the exact same company that we were last Wednesday before these two articles were published. Nothing has changed. Just because some guy reports false stuff about us doesn't mean that it changes our business. We knew she was blatantly prevaricating. And it's interesting that the government has used many of the facts that we uncovered in our stories as a basis for the criminal complaint that's now pending against uh, Elizabeth. Today, Theranos has been dissolved, and Holmes faces a federal indictment of 12 different charges, two counts of conspiracy to commit wire fraud, and 10 counts of wire fraud. The case has two parts. Prosecutors allege she defrauded both investors who gave hundreds of millions of dollars to Theranos and also patients who paid for tests. Now, with her trial about to begin on August 31st, we revisit Theranos' story and Holmes' fall from grace to understand what we can expect from a case that is shaping up to be one of the biggest trials in recent years. The woman who I will be interviewing needs no introduction. First they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. Almost every media outlet, including us here at CBS, bought into the Theranos myth. Breaking news right now, Elizabeth Holmes is stepping down as CEO of Theranos. The Theranos saga has been one of Silicon Valley's biggest scandals, and as such, it's attracted a lot of attention. To date, the Theranos story has been chronicled in a best-selling book, an HBO documentary, a podcast, and two still-to-come Hollywood adaptations. Before the journal stories, Elizabeth was a darling of Silicon Valley. She was, um, you know, viewed as um, the, potentially the next Steve Jobs. Theranos promised to revolutionize blood testing with a new technology that could diagnose everything from cholesterol to HIV using only a few drops of blood. We'd like to see a world in which every person gets access to this type of basic testing. From an early age, Elizabeth Holmes had aspirations to be an engineer. I first met her when she came to my office uh, when she was a freshman at Stanford in, I believe it was the fall of 2002. In this deposition interview, one of Holmes's earliest backers, Stanford University professor Channing Robertson, recalled that by the next year, Holmes had decided to drop out and launch Theranos. She asked me if, if I would be on her board, and I said yes. Holmes started Theranos in 2003, after dropping out as a 19-year-old sophomore. Over the next 12 years, she raised hundreds of millions from investors, and Theranos' valuation ballooned to more than $9 billion. Two former secretaries of state, Henry Kissinger and George Schultz, were members of the board of directors. And how did you first uh, become involved with Theranos? Uh, Secretary Schultz mentioned um, the company <clears throat> that um, he reached out shortly, maybe several years after I left the Senate. In this deposition taken in a civil case brought by investors, former Theranos board member and former Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist recalled the first time he met Elizabeth Holmes. They had a box there, a machine there, and told the history and, um, of her individual history and of the stage of the company at that point. Uh, do uh, remember actually at that meeting doing a finger prick. The technology and the results came back at that meeting. So you did test the technology right at that first meeting? Yes. And it was analyzed right there and then? Yes. And the results were given to you? Yes. Right there and then? Investors like the Walton family and Rupert Murdoch, executive chairman of News Corp, the journal's parent company, each invested over $100 million. Others, like former education secretary Betsy DeVos's family, invested $100 million. And Mexican tycoon Carlos Slim invested $30 million. If this technology truly worked 
it could have um, upended the, the entire blood testing industry. It could have made them a lot of money. But after the publication of two Wall Street Journal articles in October 2015, Holmes's claims began to unravel. You're now at the point where you're only testing for one thing, herpes, using your proprietary technology. Is that correct? It's not correct. Um, and there's a lot of different elements of our work that have been conf uh, conflated through these two pieces. The journal reported that Theranos wasn't using its own technology for the vast majority of its tests and was instead using commercially available machines. The company's Edison machine, the lab instrument touted as the linchpin of its strategy, handled just a small fraction of tests that were sold to consumers, and former employees told the journal the accuracy of Edison's tests was poor. So if I went to one of the centers and I got a pinprick mm -hmm. um, and I only gave that much blood, mm -hmm. right? What tests are yeah. you currently able to perform for that blood using anything other than commercially available lab equipment? So we have never used commercially available lab equipment for finger stick based tests. Okay. Every finger stick test that we have ever done uses proprietary Theranos technology that is not commercially available. Well, it sounded great for her to say that they uh, never used third-party commercially available um, blood testing technology. Unfortunately, it's not grounded in the facts. In this 2018 deposition interview, former Theranos product manager Daniel Edlin recalled a company meeting in which the use of third-party analyzers was discussed. I heard discussion about certain Theranos tests being lab-developed tests that were run on third-party machines. A 2016 journal article found that Theranos failed to maintain basic safeguards to ensure consistent results. What's more, because of the company's many questionable tests, some patients adjusted the amount of medicine they were taking. Others, like breast cancer survivor Sherry Eckert, panicked, as seen here in this 2016 Wall Street Journal video. When I went online and got the results, um, I printed them off. It looks like they're normal. And then I thought, I better go back and look at that again. Okay, what's the range, the reference range? And I noticed that it's for premenopausal women. Okay, well, that's not me. Eckert, who could be called to testify in the trial, received blood test results from Theranos that showed estrogen levels many times higher than is normal for a postmenopausal woman. Her oncologist told the journal a high estrogen level could cause cancer to recur or could be a sign of a rare tumor. Either they, th they made a mistake, they tested somebody else's blood, or their controls don't work, or I have a tumor somewhere. Great. The patients were the pawns in all this. Many of them who had gotten tests, and the tests seemed to be wildly off, they would sometimes have repeated tests at Theranos, and then when those were, were wildly off, they would go to a traditional you know, Quest or lab core. When they complained, oftentimes they would not get any kind of a response. So you have no concerns about where you are today? What we've done for the last few days is listen, right? And try to understand what are the questions that the community has, and we've been preparing material to be able to answer that for them because that, that matters hugely to me. At this event, Holmes promised to publish data proving the accuracy of Theranos' more than 240 tests. But Theranos was never able to provide that data. The records of the millions of blood tests that Theranos performed were stored on a database. But in 2018, Theranos employees dismantled the servers containing the original database. Meanwhile, prosecutors didn't realize for months that a copy they received was missing a necessary encryption code. At this point, neither the government nor Theranos or Elizabeth Holmes have access to this database anymore. Kind of extraordinary that it just sort of disappeared. Prosecutors believe that even without the database, a successful prosecution can be carried out with the anecdotal evidence available. Holmes's defense team has argued that without this database and broader data, Prosecutors shouldn't be able to call patients and doctors to the stand who said they got inaccurate test results. So they've put a lot of stake in this lost database. Prosecutors first indicted Holmes and former Theranos executive Ramesh Sani Balwani in June 2018. Holmes settled civil charges filed by the SEC in 2018. 
prosecutors say that from 2010 to 2015 in investor pitches that Elizabeth Holmes did, she basically told investors that they had this revolutionary technology, but they say that in reality that wasn't true and she knew it. Prosecutors say investors were told Theranos would generate over $100 million in revenue in 2014, and that Theranos had lucrative contracts with the Department of Defense that didn't exist. In the indictment, prosecutors point to six specific wire transfers from unnamed investors that they say were the result of allegedly fraudulent acts, including a nearly $100 million deposit to a Theranos account sent in October 2014. Intent is what matters in showing that someone intended to deceive. And so if Elizabeth Holmes's lawyers can say that she believed in the technology, that could be one line of defense. Elizabeth Holmes's lawyers could also argue um, that all Silicon Valley startups embellish to investors and that what Theranos did was no different. It's unclear if Holmes will testify in the trial or what the defense's strategy will be. To me, the most interesting element is Elizabeth Holmes going to testify on her own behalf. I mean, it's always the big question. And I tend to doubt it, but you know, uh, it, it's unclear. We don't know that. We also don't know who definitively the witnesses are going to be. Choosing an impartial jury is expected to be a major undertaking because of the substantial coverage Theranos has received. I think it could take a while and, and be an intensive process to pick the jury. Elizabeth Holmes's side is very concerned about finding jurors that aren't already prejudiced against her and the company. Holmes has pleaded not guilty. Each wire fraud count carries a maximum prison sentence of 20 years. Mm -hmm.